Hello and welcome to the IdeaCast interview series, episode number 126. My guest in this episode is Dr. Iris Stamberger. And Iris and I began talking in April of this year, 2024, at the Consilience Project, put together by Greg Enriquez and others. And we were looking at the idea of having her come on for a conversation. And um, you may know Iris from Voices with Verveke. She was on a couple times with him. And she is the founder of the Wisdom Project, which we will be discussing in this conversation. And she has quite a diverse background and to speak to perspectival knowing. She has a, uh, uh, again, a rich background to help people with, with transformative processes. She's gone from system engineering to family systems therapy, mindfulness instructor, and an organizational change consultant. So again, quite, quite the diverse background. And we talk about that and a bunch more in this conversation. So I'm uh, very grateful to Iris for coming on and having a conversation with me. And I hope to have her back in the future. And I very much appreciate you being here as well. I hope you enjoy the conversation. I'd like to welcome Dr. Iris Stamberger to the IdeaCast interview series. We began talking about four or five months ago after the Consilience Project, little shout out to Greg Enriquez. And uh, this, so this idea has been gestating for a while. And Iris, thank you so much for uh, making the time to come on to my show and have a conversation with me. I very much appreciate it. Welcome. Good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the work that I have been doing with the Wisdom Project. Yes. I, I'm happy to open up that space because in researching your work, I just felt um, much like some of the other folks, like we mentioned the Consilience Project, people who are doing really good work, uh, work that I think um, should be out there and, and, and would land well with people. So any little thing I can do to help uh, to promote that and platform it, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, and I... In saying that, I will have uh, a hello YouTube audience. Don't want to exclude you guys. I will have links uh, speaking to the YouTube audience uh, down below for Iris's uh, Wisdom Project website, as well as um, Iris's YouTube channel is phenomenal. I spent four hours today just listening to conversations with uh, you and Clayton and Melissa, and I just I just kept going. I you know I have a job that I'm fortunate I can just have podcasts going while I'm working. So anyway, I'll stop rambling. This is about you, but I just wanted to acknowledge that you have a wonderful channel on YouTube and uh, a lot of your work is exemplified there. You've been very generous uh, in, in allowing uh, public access to your work. So anyway, let's find out something about the Wisdom Project, you and the wonderful things you do. I would almost, you know, I love, uh, and I'm rambling here again, but you have a multidisciplinary background. And the way you weave things together, again, in listening all day today and yesterday when I was doing some research and getting ready, just amazing. So let's find out more about that and uh, give the audience a taste it's of that. It's life that gets you places. So if you keep swimming, you go to amazing um, places. So originally, I'm an, I'm an engineer, an electrical engineer. And I have worked, at the beginning, I worked a little as an engineer doing simulations, but my work, without me planning it, ended up being about helping organizations improve performance, uh, which is very much in vogue these days. And because I became a little frustrated how difficult it was to change the way people saw things, the way people approach a problem, to make them reframe whatever frame they had, I became interested in psychology. So thinking that it was going to be easy, I did my first master's in psychology, and then I did a PhD in interdisciplinary studies, but basically focused on cognitive science. Mm -hmm. And then, because it's a lot of theory, and I'm an engineer, a practical person who has worked with organizations forever, I needed to make it concrete. So almost like a secret without nobody ever knowing, I did another degree. It's called, it's, it's, it's half a master's called hu in human computer interaction. Okay. My PhD is from Tufts University here in the Boston area. I worked with Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, mm -hmm. um, and a developmental psychologist called David Feldman. But then when I finished my interdisciplinary PhD, I needed a, something to ground mm -hmm. my knowledge into something practical. 
So I got this degree in uh, human computer interaction, trying to understand how it is that the interaction with tools allows us to create different things in, in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm calling them, like this is the name people are using, Mindware, mm -hmm. Mind Tools, Tools for Thinking. That's Daniel Dennett called them Tools for Thinking, but other people call them Mindware. Andy Clark, the philosopher, says that our minds are extended and that we are natural born cyborgs. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we cannot just see ourselves as the brain and the body, we are extended. Language is a way, is a tool yeah. to connect. Mm -hmm. So I'm into this framework and I have been in this framework for, for many years. And um, doing the human computer interaction allowed me to use tools to try to create a space where people could teach themselves themselves to reason better, to mm -hmm. think better using, again, mindware and tools for thinking. Mm -hmm. In an abstract space, no, because uh, my work for three decades or more has been going into an, an organization. A team has a problem. They have to launch a new research project, like in the biotech area in Boston. I have worked there for years. I have also worked with universities that needed to adapt to new technology in the classroom and in the organization and to remote teaching and learning, etc. How to change the way people collaborate, mm -hmm. the way people use tools, how, how to help them reframe what they did, mm -hmm. they do. So that's why I got this third degree. And my first product uh, was very successful. It was, it was called Teaching and Learning Body of Knowledge or Talbok. And I partnered with a um, Harvard-based um, nonprofit called LASPAO. And we traveled many, many countries trying to help professors and administrators at universities use these tools for thinking to reframe the way they approach teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. And when I got tired of traveling, um, I started working with biotech companies here in the Boston area. I live next to Cambridge, Massachusetts. And um, using always, you know, how to introduce new tools that help people reframe the way, the way they think. And it was just during COVID that I had to stop working because nobody was hiring and, and you know, I had, to, I had the opportunity to stop and think anew what I have been doing for years. And in that moment, I met John Bervicki's work. And for the first time in so many years, I saw an opportunity to blend with my work as an organizational consultant, as a, you know, I think of myself as a design engineer. I help people design the way they interact with each other the way they approach a project in an organization. I saw an opportunity to integrate something that I have been doing as a hobby for more than 25 years, which is that I'm a mindfulness teacher. Mm -hmm. So now mindfulness is very popular, but 25, 30 years ago, you know, people looked at me like I was weird in the environment where I was living and working. And I never felt I could bring that into my work. But because with COVID, I was not working. And because it's more and more popular, I said to myself, why don't I bring mindfulness into the work I do? Why don't I make mindfulness one of the tools that I'm going to teach people they can use to improve the way they think about a problem. Mm -hmm. Combining mindfulness with the many other tools that I've been using for years in my work. And that's what I'm offering right now in the Wisdom Project. That's what, I, what you will see in my channel in YouTube, testimonials about, you know, engineers, psychiatrists, um, um, 
researchers, uh, college students. I have had college students in the Wisdom Project talking about the impact of using all these tools to tackle a particular problem in their lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How to reason better about the complexities of life. And listening uh, to your conversations, again, with Melissa and Clayton, um, and again, I, I just love those the flow that you guys had and, and how you were presenting your thoughts there. And um, one thing I took away, and, and you can correct me or steer me back, is in mindfulness practice, you were focusing on uh, scanning. And but it was kind of a diverse scanning. So we, you know, we scan the monkey mind or we scanned arising a, a thoughts, but also arising somatic responses and sort of this diversified monitoring experience. And, and I was thinking about that when you talk about uh, Grossman's um, um, Solomon paradox and wherein, you know, we can be very wise when we are psych psychologically distant from X, you know, <laughs> but when we are psychologically approximate to those things that come up. I, I was seeing a linkage there or a connection there. And so it might be too soon in the conversation for that, but I just had to burst that no, no, out no, because that's, when you yeah, brought up see, mindfulness, I was like- To unpack that, to unpack yeah. that. Yeah. To unpack that because this is um, mindfulness mm -hmm. about being present, being in the present moment. And you develop two skills. One is the ability to concentrate in what you want to concentrate, mm -hmm. you know, the breath, but could be an image or could be um, a flower, but you, you learn how to concentrate. And the second skill is to learn to see all the details that escape us. Mm. It's uh, using John Berwick's um, language, I would say, to enhance our relevance, relevance realization. Yes. What we Yes. Like we, we, we notice many things, but perhaps if I ask you, I don't know, if you, you know, you have a red chair, something like that in the back, mm -hmm. um, like perhaps, that. exactly. So yeah. <laughs> our vision is expanded, but there are many things we don't pay attention to. So mindfulness teaches you to notice many things that you didn't notice before. And what you see in those interviews with uh, participants in the Wisdom Project is that they are using those two skills to deal with a problem that is, or a challenge that is dear to them. Mm -hmm. It's not just mindfulness for the sake of mindfulness, being present for the sake of being present. Mm -hmm. It's about the relationship with my brother or my sister. It's about how to manage my career differently. Mm -hmm. It's about a problem that is complex. Yeah. That is not like going from here to my workplace, driving my car every morning. It's something that keeps shifting. Mm -hmm. It is called a wicked problem. Mm -hmm. I didn't call it like that. It's a technical term in what is called the science of design. How do we design solutions for future problems? And one of the strategies is what the Wisdom Project wants to present. So you have a problem, you learned with mindfulness these two skills of concentration in paying attention to detail, what you call the scanning. Mm. The scanning is because it's a technique where you scan the body or you scan something else. Mm -hmm. But the body is always there, very present, and because it's a somatic um, exercise, it will give you access to other things that I'm not going to cover right now, but it's okay. a very powerful um, strategy okay. to enhance reasoning. Okay. But it's not enough because mindfulness has been with us for 2,500 years since the first enlightenment the Buddha enlightenment and all the things that came with that tradition. And that doesn't mean that those societies necessarily have benefited greatly from the, the practice. Only the people who have the time and the disposition and, 
and the gift, you know, the possibility of going to a monastery to meditate for <laughs> forever uh, can benefit. Mm -hmm. So how can you take this to the general public? Because we have many complex problems today, many wicked problems. Mm -hmm. And the way to bring it to the general public, you also mention it, is through what is called the Solomon Paradox. Solomon um, is the famous wise man from the Bible, um, even before Jesus, even before Buddha. Um, he wrote books, he wrote um, parables, and he's well respected, but the Bible presents all the good things that Solomon had as a wise man, but at the same time, it tells the story of God being really mad at Solomon. Why? Because he was lustful. Apparently, he had like 400 wives, mm -hmm. 400 concubines. Mm -hmm. and apparently, he liked um, betting and playing cards, and he lost his fortune a few times. Mm -hmm. And he was not organized in his household, and his children were savages. So God was so mad because of his <laughs> dissolute behavior that he Foolish. said, okay, <laughs> <laughs> Foolish, how come, how come <laughs> such a wise person can be so foolish? Yeah. And so apparently, according to the Bible, God said to Solomon, Solomon, I'm not going to punish you in this lifetime because, you know, you really are wise. But your children are mm. going to dilapidate all the things you built and your kingdom is going to disappear in a few years after you're dead. That was the punishment. Mm. Because he was dissolute. He could not control his passions. Mm. So these psychologists, social psychologists from, um, he's now at Waterloo University, Waterloo University in Canada, Igor Grossman. He um, he's an ex he does experiments and he found out that Solomon is not alone. Mm -hmm. That Solomon could be really really wise. I don't know if you know the story of two ladies who came to talk to him. Please, please, Solomon. He was a very <laughs> wise judge. Uh, this is my baby. Give me a baby. No, no, this is my baby. So he thought for a moment. He said, "Okay, I have a solution. Let's just cut the baby." In two, and you will have half of it, and you. And one yeah. woman said, "Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm happy with Sounds that." Sounds good. Yeah. The woman said, "No, no, please don't kill my baby." So he, he that trick made him understand who was the real mom, and he gave the baby to that mom. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the the question that Igor Grossman asked himself and his research team was, "Why was that? Why Solomon could be wise like that?" And then foolish, like he was with the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. And then he came out with what is called the Solomon Paradox. That is the following. When it's not your problem, when it's far away from you, you think better than when he's so close to you. So Solomon was not capable of putting any rules in his household, of convincing his wives to embrace the 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 unique God of the Hebrew Bible. He could not raise his children. He could not control his passion, his lust, his desire for games and risk. Mm -hmm. Except when he was sitting in his throne, judging and making decisions about other things. Mm -hmm. So what Igor Grossman has been able to completely frame and capture is that when there is distance between ourselves in the problem, we think better. We reason better. As, as far as I know, Igor has not speculated why is that, but what he has done is to demonstrate many times over that when you tell a student, imagine that your girlfriend went with another boy, what would you do in that case? And the people say, I, I'll do ba 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 ba. And then he said, Imagine now that the girl, Peter, another boy, uh, Peter's girlfriend went with or oh, cheated on him. What would you do? 
And the answers in, in, in many, many cases are wiser, more balanced, mm -hmm. more considerate when it's not your problem. And, and we can see it's, it's natural to see it when it's not our problem. Mm -hmm. if I my nephew, uh, how will you solve a problem with your dad? My nephew would say, I would do ABC. And if I ask, how would you solve your friend's Johnny problem? My nephew would have a more balanced and reasonable response. Mm -hmm. Okay, a more reflective response. So that's what is called the Solomon Paradox. And when you were listening to the channel and listening to Melissa and Clayton and other people who are offering testimonials of their experience with the Wisdom Project, what they are telling them, telling you is that once they take, they, they develop the skill of concentration, the skill of being able to perceive in more detailed things, and then they take that problem they are dealing with or considering and take some distance, and I will explain next how to do that, how to take distance, okay. uh, they get um, better solutions, wiser solutions. What do I mean by a wise solution? Um, how do I get, again, I said it, how do I get a better relationship with my brother-in-law or my brother? Mm -hmm. How do I improve, you know, the way I deal with my boss at work, etc.? Seems like when you <clears throat> can adjudicate or counsel someone regarding a problem that, you know, the investment is not as, as deep as, as it is with your own ego and with your own uh, selfness. And, and, you know, you can calculate the implications for yourself in any kind of error of, uh, of, of the uh, value or veracity of, of the advice. So I can see that. And, and for myself, uh, just to go on a quick little tangent for have, my having done mindfulness as it was uh, for years is that I found um, almost not quite a detachment, but more of a an ability to frame selfness as mm, being fluid or, or in in a, a, a ability to be in flux with with that. So, uh, and I'm not saying this to brag or anything, but it just seems like. I'm less invested in other than the obvious things of survival, just in, in in the rightness of my decisions or the the foolishness or the error that may result from a decision. So I, I don't know if that makes sense, but I just don't feel like, you know, I would catast catastrophize uh, a bad outcome for advising myself to move prudently or, you know, wisely through a, a scenario or do the calculus on, on a comp uh, wicked problem. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the result of mindfulness or, or maybe, maybe apathy. I don't know, but it just seems like for me, I, I and, and I, that's contingent, you know, there's, there's obviously just things that could change that, but it just seems like mindfulness for me has allowed me to be a little more detached from the bruising of my ego or the bruising of um, not being right, you know, about something. Yeah. In Buddhism, they call it disidentification. Mm, okay. So I just went to a 10 meditation retreat at a center here in Western Massachusetts. And what you practice and the leaders of the uh, retreat remind you all the time that you calm your mind, you become mindful, then something is gonna arise, you know, you have a, the need to scratch your, you know, your shoulder, mm -hmm. or you remember something that happened yesterday with your husband or mm -hmm. something. And then the recommendation, the task is to not attach to it, to, to take some distance into it. Okay. So you can inquire. So you can investigate uh -huh. so you can see all the little details of what's going on. So the scanning that you mentioned at the beginning is one of the ways. Yeah. But if there is a problem with your brother again, you let that experience mm -hmm. appear. And because you have, you have been practicing mindfulness, you then are able to look at many other aspects. Mm the problem that initially were not relevant to you. Mm -hmm. So take a distance from the problem 
and then inquire. And then, of course, in the inquiry, you get an insight. You get mm. and that's why the meditation is also called insight, because then you see something that you were not seeing before. The salience comes in, yeah. The new salience, exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You see something that was there, but the frame you had to understand the particular issue uh, dissolves, and then you have an insight, and then you can reinvent the relationship. And in Buddhism, that's called de-identification. Okay, yeah. But Buddhism is no, not the only way to get there. Okay. Because we have also dialogue. You know, I'm talking about Buddhism 2,500 years ago, Buddha. Solomon didn't have a way of detaching himself from his vices, but he would have benefited from meeting a guy who was born around 400 years later in another part of the world, the Buddha, and he could have learned to de-identify himself with those urges, mm -hmm. with his lust, and perhaps inquire about it and be reflective and change that. Mm -hmm. But that's not the other skill. Another skill is one that was practiced and introduced by another wise guy who lived like 300 years after Buddha called Socrates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you see, in the Wisdom Project, we go through the Solomon Paradox, we go through <laughs> Buddha, and then we go and, and, and every time we walk, we, that historic journey of these characters who uh -huh. are eponymous representative of the best that human reasoning can create, uh -huh. we recognize the power of the tools that they have, that we have inherit, uh -huh. inherited from them. So for Socrates, it was a dialogue, a humble questioning, just listening and then questioning, Le trying to investigate instead of offering an opinion, which usually is a frame. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then when you keep questioning, an insight arises, a new way of seeing the problem, a new frame. So among the tools that we practice, it's the mindfulness, but also is dialogue, dialoguing with other people. Mm -hmm. So all of those, the mindfulness creates the identification and the dialogue too, because when you start asking somebody about, you know, are you, and Socrates did it, um, what is justice? And then the guy said, of course, I know what is justice, uh -huh. but are you sure? And, he, and then, yeah. And then the guy kept repeating until finally, okay, I really don't know what justice is. Yeah. So, so that's the idea of taking distance from a frame that you had, but that's not en enough. You know, there are many other ways of creating that distance mm -hmm. that um, that Igor Grossman found and named the Solomon Paradox. In uh, current philosophy, there is a well-known um, German philosopher called Jürgen Habermas, that has studied how cultures and societies evolve and or develop. And he talks about taking critical distance from the tradition as a way of improving the tradition. Mm -hmm. So once you have been acculturated in a tradition, then you have to make the conscious effort to stop and think and take what he calls critical distance because by doing that you reach what he calls communicative rationality mm -hmm. so we have that Solomon um, the Solomon paradox has helped Igor Grossman make a case for what he calls wise reasoning And he says, we achieve it by decentering, by taking distance. In, um, in Buddhism, you achieve uh, what they call enlightenment or insight by de-identifying yourself from what emerges. And in Jürgen Habermas philosophy, you achieve communicative rationality 
by taking critical distance from whatever was happening. So in the Wisdom Project, we are committed to improve rationality by taking distance mm -hmm. from a particular issue that interests us. In this case, the wicked problem. Mm -hmm. And there are many tools, the Buddhist mindfulness meditation for the identification, the <clears throat> Socratic dialogue, that all, also Habermas uses as a tool for increasing rationality, what he calls communicative rationality, and many other tools. Mm -hmm. There are many tools to create distance. And if you try to go to different disciplines, like in phenomenology, um, Husserl, Edmund Husserl, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the 20th century, mm -hmm. he said, he defined it as epoch, the epoch. Just stop what you are doing and take distance. You know, it's my understanding that he never, you know, I'm not an expert in phenomenology, um, mm -hmm. but the way I understand it, he never really explained how you can get there. Like in mindfulness, you know how to get there. In uh, the Habermas communicative rationality, you know how to get there. In Husserl's framework, I am not so sure. But he also talks about taking distance, taking okay. distance. So <clears throat> in the Wisdom Project, people are exposed to a total of 34 different tools that allow you to take distance mm -hmm. to create a new frame for a particular problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's appropriate right now, but when we had our pre-meet the other day, we talked about um, either family systems in psychology or um, maybe gestalt therapy and psychology and maybe that's psychology's same tools different semantics um but yeah yeah being able to reperspective the <laughs> the uh the wicked problem or or the the life of <laughs> reflecting on wicked <laughs> lingering wicked problems but yeah being able to um to not really detach, I guess, but just to again relens or 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 move the aperture or, or um yeah, but detach is a good yeah, you know, I, yeah. detach is I, I am calling it right now. I'm writing a paper and <clears throat> I am calling it imaginal distancing. Mm -hmm. Because it's 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 not imagination, it's imaginal, it's right very seriously with all the somatic experience that it okay. has and then taking the distance the first time i did this was um i was trying a new technique that is used in gestalt therapy that you mentioned that is called the three to one mm -hmm. meaning you have a problem and then you visualize the problem described from a third person perspective Oh, this is Iris that wants to go for a walk and it's already late and she doesn't know if it's safe. Third point, third person point of view. Mm -hmm. Or you can describe it as, oh, Iris, you want to go for a walk, but it's too late. And because this is getting cold outside and dark, you don't feel that it's safe for you to, you know, in a mm -hmm. conversation. And the three, two, one, third person, second person. First person is, oh, I want to go for a walk, but it's getting late. So I internalize the problem. I make it mine. Mm. And when you heard those testimonials, the people who go through the wisdom project, that doing this three, two, one has proven to be very powerful for them. Yeah. I started doing these gestalt therapies techniques even before I learned about Vipassana almost like 30 years ago when I was working with corporations mm -hmm. and learning that there are many techniques like the three to one that can help people break a frame like the boss of a team at an organization that wants to push ahead and he doesn't understand or she doesn't understand because why, why people keep leaving the team and looking for other jobs, he 
And then you create an experience where they are forced to take distance from the particular um, frame they had mm -hmm. before. In Gestalt therapy, which is a technique in psychology, a, a school of psychology, they don't call it distancing or imaginal distancing. What I'm doing is because I've been collecting these techniques from different areas, from philosophy and sociology and and from historic analysis of wisdom, etc., I gave it a name in my head, imaginal distancing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I almost see, and I'm probably not doing good faith to, you know, a, according to Hoyle definition of the imaginal, but to me, the imaginal is a domain. It's a, it's a, maybe a cognitive space you occupy. Uh, whereas the imagination is, the imaginal enacted or in action, but is the imaginal, is that fair to say that is kind of a domain, almost like um, some of our other abstracted senses like intuition or whatever, but when you're in the imaginal space, uh, that's when, you know, reframing and, and re-perspectiving is, is afforded. Is that, is that close or what do you think? When I started doing this type of work 30 years ago, I call it neo-shamanism. Mm, mm. Remember, I was an engineer. I didn't have any training in psychology, which I do have right now. Mm -hmm. um, but since the beginning of human civilization, of human existence, we have these people in every society that take seriously the task of imagining something different for the tribe. Mm -hmm. They enter into trance, with drums or dance or drugs. And then they have visions of what could be different. That's imaginal distancing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So imaginal distancing is, in my opinion, in many, many, many different expressions of, of our society, starting with the shamans. Yeah. Therefore, another technique that I have incorporated in the Wisdom Project, um, protocol is the rituals mm. so because rituals create a space what you were talking certain space where you can explore a different way of being in the world mm -hmm. a different way of relating to a particular problem mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of breaking frame or or entering the space to to either transframe or break frame uh, uh and and disrupt um, so go ahead sorry no, no, no. In disrupt, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I tend to equate ritual and disruption um, as transcendent vehicle or tools or utility for transcendent, which may not be the right word for what we're discussing, but I, that's something I always use for ritual and disruption can lead to a transcendent experience or or a deep insight or a frame break that then allows you the new perspectival uh, lensing. So I'm just sort of adding things. In, no, no, I, I, what, I totally... You are totally in agreement with what I'm trying to do. Okay, okay. Because it's about transcending who I was. Because what happens is that if we keep kissing, you know, visiting the frontiers of our understanding and breaking frames and breaking frames and breaking frames, before we notice we have been changed. Mm. We transcend who we are. Mm -hmm. Yep. So... Um, I'm excited that somebody in my extended family um, at the end of this month is going for a 10-day retreat, a mindfulness retreat, and I have not been very successful sending family members, convincing them to go to those very serious 10-day retreats because they are in silence mm. and people find it very, very difficult. But I'm excited because every time somebody I know goes to those, takes the 10 days of their lives, you know, which is a big sacrifice because it's like two week vacation. Mm -hmm. They become transformed. They transformed. So yes, it's about transcendence. So the Wisdom Project is an attempt to improve the way we reason about complex problems by using a lot of tools that have been developed throughout history and in the current 
you know, scientific environment, many tools from psychology, but also tools from Socrates and Buddha, etc. Mm -hmm. I think in, again, having listened to um, some of your conversations on your channel, uh, you mentioned three eyes too, right? That for, um, for the mindfulness practice, I, I, oh, trying to remember the eyes, uh, but I'm drawing a blank. Does that ring a bell with you? The three uh -huh. eyes. I think you referenced that in in, in one conversation, uh, relating to entering into the mind space. I guess to um, to be able to have that part of your ecology of practices uh, uh, to to go within and and again experience or scan. Um, I want to. I thought it was three eyes. It was. Uh, Oh, maybe. Um, I at this moment I don't I haven't I haven't used it recently. Okay. okay. But um, I should have written I'm it down. Is very very careful is not to go into a non secular space. Mm -hmm. I work within a very secular naturalistic mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. Many people who come to my courses in the Wisdom Project. They have very strong spiritual or religious preferences. Sometimes <laughs> not to have any religious uh, preference because they consider themselves atheists or agnostic, or sometimes having very strong religious preferences. Mm -hmm. So none of that intervenes with the fact that we are together, we are learning a skill of being able to concentrate and and scan or, or see more detail in what is salient to us. Mm -hmm. We are learning to engage in dialogue and we are learning a bunch of tools that come from psychology, such as the three to one that I described uh, from Gestalt therapy that allow us to frame and reframe reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The idea is that once the this is a seven week program that I'm teaching right now as the Wisdom Project, is that you have this portfolio of tools, like a toolkit that you can use, that is always with you. You can, like, you know, I used to, I used to be an engineer and, you know, engineers have these tools, you know, and then you use and you are gonna analyze a problem and you know that <laughs> you never can capture the totality of the problem, you just, approximate with the tools that have been created, the mathematical mm -hmm. tools or computational tools that have been created. So the idea is there is this problem. Let me see what is in my toolkit that I can use to address this problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to uh, something that I would love to bring out um, that I love about your work and that, and I jokingly call us homo technensis, but you have a more elegant word because technensis is a little bit of a critique built into that. But um, we both agree that homo sapiens sapiens is a little uh, jumping the gun a bit, you know, maybe in, a, you know, if we don't destroy ourselves in a few thousand years, we could, we could all be, <laughs> but uh, homo faber and, and you were mentioning tools that science affords us that, uh, that, you know, the disciplines of, of the social sciences can afford us and psychotechnologies that, um, help us way make. Uh, so let's talk about us as a species and our amazing ability uh, to, especially with the advent of large language models and so-called artificial intelligence. Yeah, so um, reason has taken a bad rap in the last, I don't know, 50, 60 years because psychologists, you know, discovered that very smart people can be really foolish, like mm. King Solomon. And the first psychologist to to win a Nobel Prize was Herbert Simon, who, you know, he worked in the computer, you know, he was one of the first cognitive scientists. But he basically said, we don't really reason in detail with logic about a problem. We just satisfy. He called it bounded rationality. Mm. And he had this beautiful parable of an, he was at the beach looking at an ant and he was there, you know, doing all these little things with the beautiful mounds of sand in, in the beach. And he said, we tend to, to ascribe to the brain of the ant all the beauty of the path and the complexity of the path. 
but perhaps the ant just have one or two little rules to follow. And then at the distance, once it has walked the path, we can see all this beauty. So is the terrain that is helping the ant create something. Mm -hmm. So his idea, and I don't think he used the term mind tools, um, but basically the idea is that there is the environment that gives us the possibility of reasoning differently. Mm -hmm. The ant has a limited environment. Monkeys have another environment. And we, sophisticated Westerners, have a different environment. Mm -hmm. That's why instead of, you know, criticizing reason has, uh, it has become fashionable these days mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, we can be foolish, we don't reason well, we have so many bugs, so many cognitive biases. Every time I check the literature of cognitive biases, there are 10 to any more cognitive biases. We make so many mistakes in reasoning. Uh -huh. I would say, you know, no, we evolved in a niche, in an environment, and we're very good at making decisions in that environment. Uh -huh. But we also have created a very complex series of problems and challenges that require that we use the tools that we have also created, such as language, uh -huh. such as dialogue, such as mindfulness, such as a three to one. So my invitation is let's just become wiser, let's just reason better by acknowledging that even when we get the best degree at the university, we are not finished, that we have always to review our frame mm -hmm. because the problems have become wicked, complex, dynamic, and we cannot believe because that's what my father taught me, my mom, that's what my mother taught me, this is the way I was raised, that I have the right perspective on the problem. Yeah. yeah. Using the tools, acknowledging that we are not homo sapiens. That was a very arrogant name. We are homo faber, F-A-B-E-R. The, 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 the homo hominus that builds things. Mm -hmm. And we have all these things that we have created that can help us reason better to mm -hmm. solve the problems of today. Makes me think of Aristotle's uh, tripartite, uh, what was virtue, I guess, where it was... Uh, Techne, praxis, phronesis, and maybe yeah. repeat, you know, and 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 phronesis is a wisdom that is practical, I think, and and maybe accessible in that you are seeking uh, to value or understand means, ends, relations, and things like that. Or maybe the fact value relations that you guys were working with, we could bring that up or we can save that for another conversation. But just having that that ability to recognize what's going on in sense making and and um and wisdom cultivation or or approaching wisdom uh, yeah there is a group of um of cognitive scientists or philosophers who are uh, popularizing the term participatory sense making mm. because we participate of the culture we participate of the tools of the culture to make sense of things mm -hmm. i like a lot that that type of approach mm -hmm. So I, I am working to, to see exactly how to define that, but it's understanding that to confront the challenges of today, we need to embrace the idea that our development as human beings is not complete. We have box in our thinking, but we also have all these tools developed through the years, through the ages to help us reframe things. Mm -hmm. And again, I repeat, you know, mindfulness, um, dialogue, but also ritual, mm -hmm. creating that because, you know, you, we have to go, we have to go to work, we have to take care of the kids, we have to cook, we have to, you know, we have to live, okay? Yeah. But if we create a little space of ritual, a little, you know, almost like sacred space where we review things, we can improve the way we reason. I, I, I think of it like... Um, like a, a new enlightenment, you know, um, the the need for all of us to cultivate enlightened reasoning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, 
this scientist, Igor Grossman, gave us a very useful um, map to get there because, as I said, he's the one who created the Solomon Paradox um, example that I used at the beginning of this conversation. But he has been also working to understand what is exactly that we call the wise. Mm. What happens when we say, oh, Socrates is wise, Solomon was wise in this area, but not in others. Yeah. Uh, you know, Buddha, what, what is it? So he has come out with this model that has to do with being able to take the perspective of the other. Because that's what's happened when you start reframing, 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 and you become transform yourself, you transcend who you were, you have another perspective. Yeah. So he has been developing that idea. And then uh, a few years back, he organized a bunch of um, psychologists and philosophers who do experimental uh, research and, and research on wisdom. And they got in, and they made a, a survey, a global survey of what people consider wisdom. And they came out with the idea that is, they call it um, perspectival, you know, complex the names, bees, you know, they are right, scientists. Right. Perspectival metacognition. Okay. That wisdom is perspectival metacognition, meaning you are able to <clears throat> meta metacognition is because you are reflecting on your way on your own way of seeing the world, mm -hmm. and it's per perspectival because you take different perspectives. Yeah. And that perspectival metacognition is combined with a commitment to moral excellence. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> you don't use the, the new ability to reason just for the sake of yourself, but to fulfill a moral goal. So um, that has allowed me that type of um, contribution from Igor Grossman and the, all the researchers. John Verbicki was part of that research group. Okay. They created a common wisdom model and they define the common wisdom model because each one of them had a different model of wisdom. <clears throat> and now they have this common wisdom model. What they say is perspectival metacognition with a component of moral excellence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That contribution has allowed me to ground that into a pedagogical protocol, which I offer in the wisdom project. <clears throat> yeah, yeah which I would invite the audience to be curious and enter into inquiry <laughs> into your work. And, you know, you mentioned the ant earlier, you were referencing the ant and his, and their topology and, and almost a niche construction that goes on and how the, the ant adapts to navigate and, you know, rehome home themselves back to, to their colony or whatever. And I think of us and we're talking about reason uh, and we are in an abstracted niche construction in a psychosocial sense, you know, that that, that we have a layer of, of wicked uh, fluidity, you know, just this constant complex um, sets ecology of problems, if you will, or, or uh, uh, solutions waiting to be had. And I think about when you mention reason, um, you get the cliche like the Dawkins Harris kind of very narrow bandwidth reason where it's all very propositional and and logical and so forth. But but what you're doing and what I think any good wisdom um, mendicant or or student uh, is and I'm not saying you're is a mendicant student, but I'm just some, somebody who's entering into that uh, willingness to um, to to learn about wisdom is that that bandwidth has to open and expand and include perspectival. Uh, knowing or metacognizing and also you know all the piece you know the participatory and procedural the techne as we had talked about in our pre-meet which again is part of maybe a circularity of of sense of of um, predictive processing that gets us forward to the next frame of of sense making so and that's what I see in your wisdom project which I just think is absolutely uh, rich and um, and much needed in, in um, someone who is seeking to solve their their meta crisis or yeah, their their existential uh quandary that they might might find themselves dealing with um good medicine in 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 our in our age but yeah it seems like with with us being homo faber and um i always see a cost benefit analysis is necessary when a new technology or a new 
approach to problem solving again like machine learning like we hire these you know we used to have old clunky mechanical slaves that made lives a little more convenient and and helped us out with uh, efficiency and and now we're entering into an age where we have the extended mind uh doing heavy lifting for us and and there'll be uh good things and there'll be moloch things and so uh but wisdom must temper that would would that make sense to say that that has to be baked in <laughs> into the next pursuit that therefore the cost benefit uh won't be like this it'll be more keeping itself in a tonos or attention yeah i believe that every new uh, innovation will create wonderful solutions but also terrible problems you mm -hmm, know? Mm -hmm. it's a risk when you create something new that new problems will arise um, and this is going to be the same but in this case i believe that cultivating wisdom cultivating this what i call enlightened reasoning is going to be a must because of the very terrible consequences of misuse of these new powers that mm -hmm. we are developing. Mm -hmm. And do you see the thought leaders, the tech leaders, the people who are spearheading a lot of this as having those Solomon-esque properties in the sense that um, their near, uh, hmm, what's, the, what's the right word, um, endogenous foolishness, the, the Solomon, you know the the close proximal psychology um yeah how do you penetrate that how do you how do you uh, that to me that seems like a way to intervene it, or or be preventative or proactive is that these folks are imbued or endowed with that kind of ability to do what you're teaching and to and to learn uh that your idea of a of a great solution may be fraught with with unforeseen things or unforeseen consequences. So I wonder, um, you know, how does that get baked into the, to the creative process and the pioneering imaginal uh, process of developing the next generation or iteration of, of what Homer Homo Faber does. I mean, how do we do that? Well, it's a <laughs> collective, easy it's question. A, it's a collective project. Okay. Um, and and I and I see many people working on it, even though it seems disjointed and it doesn't seem like it's not yet a unified effort. Mm -hmm. uh, but people are understanding that more and more the more and more we create progress, we create risks, and you know, with a virus or an, a nuclear explosion or you know or these uh, incredible powers that AI is developing <laughs> at every second, yeah. we risk uh, our lives and the lives of the of the rest of the species. But um, there is a consciousness growing up that we have to be humble mm -hmm. and that we have to be willing to learn and reframe what we understood before. I'm not saying that the current titans of tech um, are like that. They are, mm -hmm. I don't think they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, every time uh, we see people being successful and then they have the hubris to think that they can know and, and opine about everything else. So it's mm -hmm. kind of normal. But, you know, if you think where we were 150 years ago as a society, uh, only one of every 10 people knew how to read and write. Mm -hmm. Um, people had to have six or seven children to be able to have one child that survived to adulthood. Right. And so now where I live in Massachusetts, uh, almost 35% of the adult population has a college degree. So there is big social change and people are making contributions. And I'm going to go back to the model that... Um, Igor Grossman offered about the common wisdom model and his own wise reasoning model, which have helped me create a simple skill set that I can teach people to focus on. This is what you need to achieve to continue in your path towards wisdom. It's not just that, oh, here are the tools, 
These are, you know, dialogue, mindfulness, ritual, three to one, and many, many more. No. Besides that, there is a pathway that you have to follow that is called the FAV skill set. Mm. P-H-A-V. You know, <laughs> to make it a pedagogical protocol that you can carry with you, that, you know, mm -hmm. that you can share with your spouse. Mm -hmm. And the, the skill set is perspectives, work to gain perspectives. P H A V, FAV. You know, I call it FAV or FAP. I don't know how to pronounce it well in English. Uh -huh. A FAV skill set. Perspectives, work to gain perspectives. Humility, practice humility. Uh -huh. Practice adaptability, you uh -huh. know, because everything you know is not going to be enough for the next challenge that is going to be presenting to your uh, itself. And the FAV, the last one is virtue. So cultivate P H A V perspectives, humility, uh, adaptability, and virtue. Mm -hmm. and what I have done with the Wisdom Project is that after teaching many many rounds of it, of the course, the protocol, <clears throat> my colleague Michael Mascolo and myself, we recently published a paper. Uh, where we show how people that we interviewed at the beginning of the protocol, in the middle of it, it's a seven-week protocol where we meet for two hours every week online, and then people have to do a homework, doing dialogue with um, a peer. Um, people increase in all the four um, skills of the skill set. Uh -huh. They gain ability to shift perspective. They become able to be humble with their framing and thinking about the particular issues at, at hand. They adapt the knowledge that they have, and then they ex express virtue. They they talk about courage and justice and fairness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it seems to me. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. And so the idea is that. <clears throat> You know, I think somebody like Verviki would say it's cultivation of character, mm -hmm. but for me, it's cultivation of reasoning. Mm. How are we going to reason about these very difficult problems? Well, we have to learn to take different perspectives, to be humble, to adapt the knowledge, and to practice virtue, virtue, yeah. which would benefit greatly the titans of the technology world today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's reason, to, I'm starting to see a picture that this is reason mediated by wisdom and perspectival uh, flexibility. And vis-a-vis -vis raw intelligence, the reason that, again, I was saying was kind of a narrow aperture of, of uh, one definition of reason, which is, again, to be very logical and very uh, rigorous and empirically sound and, you know, evidence-based and yada, 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 which is, is a component to me, as strikes me as being a necessary component. But when you're relying on that solely, again, it's like propositional tyranny. If you're just in that one P, then, you know, where are you going to go? And it seems like a, a, in, in talking about tech giants versus the commons with, with the culture at large, that if the culture at large uh, can cultivate a wisdom practice or an ecology of practices that help to help with salience landscaping, to use for vacay language, that mm -hmm. there is a reciprocal uh, relationship that opens up wherein they have this salience, the common folks like myself or the general population, to see what is being wrought and is it wise? And, you know, do we use discretion and software scene and these other things to to enter into a, maybe a synthesis relationship where, um, you know, in other words, the masses lead the tech giants. This is kind of really stretching things, but you know, almost again, recognizing that there is there is peril perhaps in unfettered or unrestricted uh, unleashing of power. Again, like you know, we use machine learning as an example, but that that if an aware community can be focused and lensing things again the way you're teaching people that they'll see that and they'll say, okay, I need to enter into relationship with this technology or with this new product or whatever it is with a little bit of prudence, with a little bit of um, 
reason that is, you know, broad and, and comprehensive. It's a big ask, but I don't know. I'm just trying to see a relationship here wherein but right now we're just sort of blindly consuming for convenience sake and if, you know, or dopamine, you know, fulfillment or whatever, when, when the next toy comes out or the next thing comes out. But if we could be wiser, then we would understand what, what value do we really need in life? We don't need another, you know, attention economy distraction or another dopamine oxytocin fix thing, you know, like, like social media does to, to kind of hijack our attention, but, you know, maybe something wherein if we are starved for wisdom and if we are in a meta meaning crisis or whatever, that that onboarding of that technology and that toolbox full of tools might be and even in a simpler case that we want to switch jobs or careers and do not know how to do it right or we loved our spouse but things have gotten difficult and we don't know how to go back to where we were or we would you know Practical things where we can have the framework of the skills to cultivate that I just mentioned mm -hmm. and a bunch of tools mm -hmm. to use. Okay, now I'm going to be, I have five minutes. I don't like, you know, Verviki, John Verviki has a very specific way to differentiate what he calls psychotechnologies from what Andy Clark called um, <clears throat> mindware, from what Daniel Dennett called um, tools for thinking, and there are other Perkins and Nisbet, they have written books with the title Mindware. So they know exactly what they mean. I am at heart an engineer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for me, I just call them tools. Yeah. Tools that help me reason better about a particular issue. Mm -hmm. So it's having this, this basket of tools that I can use for a particular problem. Mm -hmm. for me, because I have been a mindfulness meditator for so many years. I I use a technique called Vipassana, mm -hmm. which means insight, which is the one that apparently the Buddha taught. And it helps me when I have when I'm, when I'm confronted with a situation in life, I just sit and meditate and the somatic experience of bringing forth the situation and then de-identifying from it as I described and then inquiring about it. Mm -hmm. So it gives me ways to proceed, but it doesn't happen like that all the time. Okay. And so I also have a bunch of other tools, like the one I described, the three to one. I take the problem, so describe what's happening with me. I get this email at 6 a.m. I am an early bird, and this person is also an early bird. And every time I get an email from this person, I get irritated. And I'm like, Aries, where is your mindfulness? So <clears throat> you, just by doing the mindfulness technique didn't help because okay. the psychotechnologies like mindfulness sometimes require a lot of time to provide results. But you know what? I use this technique from psychotherapy called the 3 to one where mm -hmm. I see the problem from a third person perspective, a second person, and suddenly fish, there is a shift. You see? Yeah. Like yeah. that, you know, there are, Techniques, tools, very easy to use the same way that, I don't know, I use my, my translator every time I'm reading a word in English that I don't understand. I just go and, and Google Translate. And you see, yeah, it's like living a life like the same way I use the pen and the, and the, pe and the notebook, <laughs> I got the mine. fork, <laughs> and, and the comb, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Having all these tools to accompany me to navigate the complexity of life. Yeah. That's the idea. I mm -hmm. call it wisdom by design. How do, you know, designing a life where you can have meta, perspectival metacognition. Mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. in the model. Because life is complex and you will be presented with so many challenges and you cannot have the luxury of the monks that they go and spend six months on retreat. For me, going once a year is a lot, you see? So how do we make that something that everybody can use, that everybody can learn? And if if a wicked problem is a complex problem, then having a, a, a rich and endowed toolbox of, of utility of tools is wicked solution or, um, is that not doing 
wicked. I'm trying to not put a negative connotation on wicked, but like just that complex solution or 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 the agility to yeah. to be able to use tools when necessary to respond to complexity. That that kind of flexibility or agility to uh, to know the tool that is necessary. The important thing is to understand that many many problems are complex. Many many problems cannot be solved just by slicing the problem in steps and addressing task one, task two. They are not linear problems. Mm -hmm. Like going to the moon is very complicated, but it's not complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Building a, a, a super tower in the downtown is very complicated, but it's not complex. Mm -hmm. You can split the problem, go one step at a time. Complex is solving climate change. Complex mm -hmm. is solving um, loneliness or homelessness. Complex is improving the relationship with my brother. Mm -hmm. That's complex. And those, that com those complexities are what design scientists from Stanford mm, years ago defined as wicked problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a wicked problem has certain characteristics um, like it's difficult to explain exactly what it is. There are many possible solutions. Um, <clears throat> there are conflicts of values because I want to achieve this, but also that. Mm -hmm. There is ambiguity. So um, I make a point of helping every person who approaches mm -hmm. the Wisdom Project to develop a very clear, wicked problem that they're going to work with to see if they are improving in their quest for wisdom, in the reasoning abilities. Mm -hmm. For me, wisdom is a special kind of reasoning, enlightened reasoning. That's how I see it. I like that. Yeah, that's nice. And when I listen to Dave Snowden uh, talking about complexity, he's funny. I, that, yeah, I guess he still brings it up. He'll reference uh, Frozen 2. And um, the one I, I've never seen the movie, but there's two sisters and one sister doesn't have magic powers and she's singing the song in Frozen 2. And it's like, I can only do the next best thing, you know, <laughs> and that to me is navigating complexity. <laughs> he, he keeps it very simple. Now he's talking about waggle dances with bees. And I got to try to figure that one out, I, I, you know, stigmergy and things like that, I guess. But yeah, I love that, that he just can narrow it down to a simple song from a children's movie. <laughs> yeah far more complicated in the background but at least you can come up with that one little tool and i can only do the next best thing you know which is good predictive processing it's 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 your ability to calculate and then say well you know how do i enter into the next frame of of, of what of what's going on so we've gotten just over an hour and i want to ask if there's something in context or in in uh continuity with what we've been talking about that you think we sh should bring to this conversation uh before we before we wrap it up because we are, had talked about you coming back and i would love to have you back because we can uh the, the only thing that <clears throat> besides i already mentioned the tools mm -hmm. in the different ways different researchers approach the name psychotechnologies or <clears throat> mindware, et cetera. i'm just missing uh what the vicky calls cognitive styles what others psychologists call uh, dispositions, um, uh, psychologists of rationality. Um, Keith Stanovich talks about dispositions that facilitate rationality. Okay. That you have to cultivate something to get to be more rational, to cultivate what Jorgen Habermans calls communicative rationality, mm -hmm. to cultivate rationality that Igor Grossman calls wise reasoning, okay. to cultivate rationality beyond what Herbert Simon defined as, uh, you know, um, satisfying on, or, or bounded rationality. Mm -hmm. And those dispositions, uh, I have taken, you know, the literature and created a set of dispositions that people try to cultivate using the tools of the wisdom project. For instance, the first disposition is to aspire. Mm. A very simple one. And it's in, since we have mentioned Verviki <clears throat> a few times, it's in uh, 
video 44 of awakening to the meaning crisis mm -hmm. of, uh, where after he has analyzed the different models of wisdom that are out there including the common model of wisdom uh, he says okay but that, what do we need and then the first one that he comes out with is aspiration you know aspiring to be to become mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, that's for the wisdom project very very helpful because people then embrace the possibility of being changed, of being transformed by mm -hmm. this. Another cognitive style or disposition um, that Verviki uh, mentions, and that is uh, the work of this uh, rationality researcher, Keith Stanovich, is um, active open-mindedness, the commitment to be open-minded actively. Mm -hmm. I think it's very simple. I want to aspire. Like if you think that intelligence is fixed, you would not take the risk of improving. But we know uh, that intelligence is flexible. So I am aspiring to be better, to be smarter. And then I have the tools for that. And then I'm aspiring to be more open-minded. And then we have the tools for that. Mm -hmm. And a tool that people love that um, is a compendium of mm, a lot of research on emotions that is very important in the wisdom project is emotional landscaping. You know, the ability to elicit a particular emotional state mm -hmm. and then cultivate it. Okay. Like joy that is happening right now in politics. Let's cultivate joy. Mm. Why? Because there is a disposition that is very important, which is self-regulation. The disposition, I make a commitment to cultivate the disposition of self-regulation, being able to regulate, you know, being on time for a meeting, but also my emotional state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically I have covered all the pieces of this pedagogical protocol that I call the wisdom project that is part of my big ambitious goal of promoting the idea that wisdom by design is possible, that we can design a life where we reason like the wise people of the past and the present using their tools and new tools from psychology and philosophy. Taking advantage of what we've learned. Yeah. Well, Iris, this has been a pleasure for me, and I've I've been learning from you since, again, we talked back in April. I've been getting some uh, good insights from your work, and I would love to encourage the YouTube audience to, uh, again, down in the description field, be curious and check out your work. And again, you have so much to offer on your YouTube channel that's available uh, for, to whet people's appetite to get them in into the arena and uh and 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 see what you're doing and uh, i'm thoroughly impressed and uh i hope that others uh, will make that discovery but thank you so much for uh being in conversation with me i appreciate it and i look forward already to having you back and uh okay. thank you very much it was others... really, really wonderful to talk to you well i appreciate you and i appreciate the work you're doing so um you're <laughs> you've got a person cheering you on uh, one more person cheering you on. So yeah, that, that'll be, uh, going forward. Um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be supportive of what you're, uh, endeavoring to achieve. So, uh, to the YouTube audience, thank you all so much. Like I said, check out in the description field, uh, to find out more about Iris's work. She'll be back for another conversation. Maybe, uh, before the end of the year, we'll get her back and have, have another chat. So I, or dialogue. <laughs> I look forward to that. So Iris, I'll say goodbye to you after I stop recording, but thank you so much for your time and attention, YouTube audience. I appreciate you very much. So take care.